Good afternoon and welcome to the seventh Presidential Frontier Award Lecture. Um, these seven awards, I'm, I've been there for six of them. I missed the first one. I attended the remaining six. Represent an incredible range of talent, and I'm not making this up. Um, last year, it was a category theorist. If you don't know what, a, what category theory is, it's not useful to ask other mathematicians. They don't seem to know either. But it turns out we have the best, one of the best category theorists in the world, and she won the PFA last year. Other winners of the PFA have included people like uh, Michael Hirsch, who's a composer, actual composer, Pulitzer Prize winner. So this is an extremely broad range of very, very accomplished people who are at the cusp of achieving greatness in their field that get the Presidential Frontier Award. And uh, what I wanted to say to this year's finalists and awardee is that the main goal of the award is to imbue you with a long, I'm sorry, a deep and abiding sense of guilt, right? Just one person gets it in the entire university. It's discretionary friends of the university which was gifted to us by the chair of the board of trustees. And so this is about as precious money as it, as it gets. Think of it as your Nana's dollars. And, and therefore, we expect you to put it to good use and to do very well. So before uh, I go any further, rule number one of being provost is thank the sponsors. So of course, I would like to express our gratitude to Lou Forster, the chair of the board of trustees, who has made a million dollar donation in conjunction with David Smilow to make this award possible. And so, and the second thing I'd like to do is to recognize the finalists who, you know, next time. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Sapna Kuchatkov, who is the Associate Professor of Anesthesiology, please, please give her a hand. She's working on a center of excellence to improve short and long-term neurocognitive, psychosocial, and physical outcomes for hospitalized children and their families. I wish you the very best. Anthony Leung, Associate Professor of Biochemistry in the Bloomberg School of Public Health. <laughs> who's, who's using AI tools to analyze and predict RNA structure and function. And biophysics to dissect, and this is the one bad part of such presentations. I have to pronounce acronyms and the words that don't mean anything. To dissect SRD mechanisms to understand how RNA folds into structures and triggers degradation. I'm sure it means something to the rest of you in the audience, but it sounds pretty cool. So congratulations. And finally, Laura Wood, Associate Professor of Pathology in the School of Medicine, to collaborate with uh, engineers to create novel three-dimensional multi-omic analysis of human pancreatic tissue and focusing on the early stages of pancreatic cancer detection and prevention. So thank you all for all that you do. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Paul Rothman, the Dean of School of Medicine, to introduce, uh, to give his thoughts and, uh, in, and talk about our dinner today. Thanks, Neil, and good afternoon. I'll begin by congratulating you, Andrew, for this wonderful honor. Uh, we've been waiting. You were named in February, so it's been a little wait to get this lecture in, but we're so uh, proud of you and your accomplishments and that the university uh, provided you these resources and recognized you. So congratulations, Andrew, and we're so glad that you received it. So I'm here to talk a little bit about Andrew uh, and the work he's done, and then we'll hear Andrew talk about his lecture. So as you can tell, for those who don't know Andrew, he's not from around here. He, uh, he's from across the pond. Uh, went to Cambridge as an undergrad, then Manchester for his PhD, where he worked for Steve Taylor on regulation of anaphase. And I, in some way, Andrew, you've been very consistent in trying to understand cell cycle, cell cycle regulated genes. Um, he then went to his postdoc at UCSD, where he worked for Don Cleveland 
on control of chromosomal segregation. And we have a lot of scientists here, so I don't have to explain in detail how important it is uh, to understand the regulation of how chromosomes are distributed uh, when cells divide. It's, you know, it's one of those biologies that is really amazing. I mean, you know, when you step away and you think about somehow a cell divides and it figures out exactly to put in uh, to divide those 46 chromosomes among two daughter cells, exactly the right ones, exactly the right number. Um, it's really an amazing process. And, and I can remember as an undergrad watching the movies of the process occur as someone goes through mitosis. And it still is one of those visualizations that sticks with you the rest of your life because it's such an elegant system. And to study it at a molecular level, I think, has been something people have been doing for years, but the sophistication of work that Andrew performs here, and what I really like about Andrew's work is how he has taken this fundamental question about how you segregate chromosomes uh, in a precise manner and look to see how the role it plays in diseases, and much of his work is around cancer. And uh, I think it has been really elegant, Andrew, about attacking a really important clinical problem from a very basic aspect. And I was going to make um, your, la your big paper last year in Nature. I was going to ask the provost to describe it because it's called Trim 37 Driven Centrosome Dysfunction in 17Q23 Amplified Breast Cancer. And I was just going to challenge Sunil to say that. But, um, <laughs> but really, actually, was it, I, as I told Andrew, I got to read it last night. I read some of his papers, and it's really elegant work. Uh, and it's so great to have you here at the School of Medicine, to have you doing such important work with us, and I think it is just wonderful that the university has recognized your talent and the science that you are performing right now with, I assume, a great lab, because I know you're not probably at the bench very much these days. So thank the people in your lab for your work, and thank you for really helping to lead this field in, in a, what I think is in a really important uh, and, um, insight into how dysfunction of this may play a role in tumor genesis. So with that, I'm going to introduce Andrew Holland. Andrew? Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's obviously a, a great honor and a privilege to have received this award and I share it with all of the people in my lab, both past and present. I also want to congratulate the other finalists. It's uh, really humbling to be recognized amongst this group of scientists. So my goal today is to try to make that title understandable. My lab is fundamentally interested in the mechanisms that control cell division and broadly how these impact human health and disease. One of my favorite pastimes when I'm not in the lab is to play Lego with my son, Max. Now this, of course, is a very old toy. It was created in the 1940s in Denmark. And it's built around this very simple principle of a series of interlocking bricks that all have the same underlying design principle. On the surface, they have studs, and underneath, they have holes. Think of those as ligands and receptors. And these bricks come in a variety of different forms and, and colors and shapes. But because they all have this similar design principle, you can connect them together to build things that resemble items in the real world. And with creativity and imagination, you can build complex structures, the Colosseum in Rome, Taj Mahal. And if you go to Legoland, you'll be lucky enough to notice that they even build entire cities out of these structures. And on the surface, these appear incredibly complex. But at their heart, they're all made out of plastic blocks with studs and holes. So it turns out that the dizzying diversity of life on our planet is also built from a very fundamental principle, and that is that all living things are built of the same unit, and that is the cell. Now, cells can exist on their own, and they can be single-celled organisms, or they can come together and collaborate and make more complex structures and multicellular organisms. And just like Lego, cells come in different forms and functions, and so they can make different tissues and organs. And in our cells, for example, we have over 200 different cell types that collaborate to make an organism with 37 trillion cells. Now, each, all of the behavior of humans, all of our emotions, all of our health and disease ultimately has the root 
in those cells. So to understand the cell is really to understand the basis of life. And my lab is interested in this question of how you make a cell. And fundamentally, you cannot make a cell de novo. Only a cell can make a cell. So here's a schematic representation of a cell. It's a complex structure, but it's really this lipid encased bag of macromolecules. And inside of it, there's this blueprint, this genetic information that really encodes how cells behave and function. And in nature, this is encoded in this chemical, deoxyribose nucleic acid, or DNA. And in each of the cells of our body, there's more than two meters of DNA that's packaged down inside a structure called a nucleus that's thinner than the width of a human hair. And in human cells, we don't have one continuous piece of DNA. We have 46 separate pieces of DNA. And those pieces are called the chromosomes. We get 23 of them from mom and 23 of them from dad. So to make a new cell, you have to replicate this. You have to make an identical copy of all of these chromosomes, and then you have to distribute them into two separate directions to create a cell that has one copy of every chromosome. And that process is known as cell division, or mitosis. And so you can see it here in this schematic representation. In interphase, the DNA is inside of the nucleus, and it compacts down at the beginning of mitosis into the chromosomes, and these chromosomes are 10,000 times shorter than the DNA that encodes them. The nuclear membrane that holds the chromosomes is broken down, and then there's an assembly of a spindle apparatus that's, that's built during mitosis for the specific job of partitioning the genetic information. And this spindle apparatus is made up of these linear filaments shown in green called microtubules. Now these microtubules connect to the chromosomes and align them in the middle of the cell. And each of these chromosomes contains two identical DNA molecules created following DNA replication. And then in an irreversible transition, the chromosomes split, and one copy of each chromosome comes apart and is deposited to opposite size to create two identical daughter nuclei. Now that's a complex process, and for a general lecture, I wanted to break this down into a medium that we could all appreciate, cupcakes. So here you can see the DNA in red. This aligns here, it compacts down, eventually aligns on the middle of the cell, separates apart to create two identical cupcakes. And so in this, the chromosomes are in red, microtubules are in green, and in brown is chocolate. Okay, so let's look at this in a more dynamic form. So this is a, a movie of a Xenophis epithelial cell. At the beginning of this movie, you can see the chromosomes compacting down inside of the nucleus. This is the nuclear membrane that'll be dissolved in a moment. Those chromosomes will be spilled out into the sides of the cell. There they're gonna meet the microtubules of the mitotic spindle apparatus that are connecting to these chromosomes and moving them around, organizing them in the center. But this cell will not complete division until all of the chromosomes are aligned and connected. So this one over here is a little lost, and all of its friends are waiting for him. Eventually, this chromosome will move to the middle with everybody else, and now these chromosomes split longitudinally along their length, and one identical copy of each replication product is pulled apart and partitioned into the two daughter nuclei. So this is one of the most dynamic and beautiful processes in all of biology. And it's really a fundamental basis of life itself. This is what underlies the ability of a cell to make a copy of itself. And it's a process that brought everybody into this world because we start out as one cell generated by the fusion of a sperm and an egg that has to go through millions of divisions to create a complex organism with trillions of cells. So here is a movie of a zebrafish embryo. And at the beginning here, each of these white structures is one nucleus. And you can see that there are tens of uh, cells in the beginning of this movie. But as I play this and this embryo runs through development, you'll see that there are hundreds of divisions occurring to make hundreds then thousands and eventually millions of cells. And if you take one of these zoom-ins here, you can see how mitotically active these early stages of development are. And during every single one of the divisions that you see in this embryo, it's critical that the chromosomes are faithfully partitioned to ensure that all the cells have a complete complement of all the information needed for further growth and development. 
And errors that occur in chromosome segregation early in embryonic development are a leading cause of spontaneous abortions and miscarriages in the human population. And moreover, they're also responsible for genetic defects, such as Down syndrome. So on the left here is the normal human carrier type, 23 pairs of chromosomes, one of each of these pairs from mom and one of each of these pairs from dad. Here is the carrier type of an individual with Down syndrome that has an extra copy of chromosome 21 because of a chromosome segregation error during cell division. Now there's nothing special about chromosome 21 other than it's the smallest chromosome with respect to the number of genes it encodes. And therefore the imbalance from having an extra copy of this chromosome is tolerated and compatible with life. Chromosome segregation errors produce three copies of all the other human chromosomes, likely at similar frequencies, but the vast majority of these lead to early embryonic lethality. Now cell division isn't only required to build an organism, it's also required for our long-term health and well-being because every day in our bodies, millions of cells divide in order to replace lost and damaged cells in our tissues and organs. And one of the greatest diseases we face as a species is cancer, which at its root is dysregulated cell proliferation. It's cells that are dividing uncontrollably at the expense of the host. And we know that when cancer cells divide, they make frequent mistakes in chromosome segregation that ultimately leads to the production of cells that have the wrong number of chromosomes. So you can see an example of this here from a typical karyotype from a human cancer cell, and it's highly deranged. Both numerically and structurally, these chromosomes have been uh, changed. And this occurs because of ongoing errors in chromosome segregation during mitosis that ultimately endow these cells with novel genetic complements that drive abnormal behavior that can promote the evolution of these tumors. And this change in chromosome number is actually the most common genetic aberration we see in cancers. More than 90% of solid human tumors have abnormalities in the chromosomal complement. And some specific cancers have particular changes in chromosome number that are more common than even the most commonly mutated tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes. Now, if at its heart cancer is dysregulated cell proliferation, then it stands to reason that killing dividing cells would provide an attractive anti-cancer strategy. And in fact, this is something that we've been doing in the clinic for decades now, and is best recognized with this chemotherapeutic drug, paclitaxel, which is a natural product derived from the bark of the Pacific yew tree, originally identified in an NCI drug screening platform, and then later commercialized by Bristol Myers Squibb, Paclitaxel is the best-selling chemotherapeutic of all time, and it's still used today to cure patients with breast and ovarian cancer. Now, this drug acts, and this was discovered by Susan Horowitz, by binding to microtubules of the mitotic spindle. It poisons the microtubule spindle apparatus and ultimately kills dividing cells. And this has been used successfully in the clinic for over 25 years, and this has spurred the development of a whole suite of additional microtubule targeting agents, and they're shown over here. Many of these are still used in the clinic, vinblastin, vincristin, et cetera. And although these drugs are exceptionally valuable, they do have limitations. Most notably, there are cancers that are intrinsically resistant to these drugs. They don't respond to these agents. In addition, these agents also cause defects in non-proliferating cells, because microtubules aren't just used during cell division, they're used during interphase, especially in neurons. So treatment with these drugs causes devastating neuropathies in patients. And as a result of this, about 15 years ago, the cell division community took on the challenge to develop new drugs that can kill dividing cells, and we broadly call these anti-mitotic drugs. And they basically targeted enzymes that specifically function in mitosis, such as the kinases, Aurora, PLK1, MPS1, and kinesins, molecules that walk along microtubules. And these antimitotic drugs are extremely potent and highly specific. And using these, we've learned a lot about the action of these molecules during cell division. But unfortunately, over the last 15 years, one after another, all of these antimitotic drugs have all failed to advance in clinical trials. And so now we're faced with the question of what went wrong. And I think that it's very clear today that the major limitation 
of all antimitotic agents, including the microtubule targeting agents, is that they fail to discriminate between killing tumor cells and killing healthy proliferating cells. And one of the most proliferative cell types in our body lies within the bone marrow of our long bones, where white blood cells are produced that circulate in our blood and help fight infection. And the humble neutrophil is about 50 to 75% of our circulating white blood cells. And this blood type, this cell type, has a very short half-life. It only lasts about 12 hours in our bodies. And so you need millions of divisions every day just to replenish your neutrophil pool. And what happens in all of these patients that are treated with these antimitotic drugs is you get dose-limiting neutropenia, where you kill these neutrophils, and that leads to life-threatening infections that ultimately limit the dose and the duration of these therapies. And so therefore, we have to ask ourselves now, can we do better? And in particular, could we develop agents that could specifically kill dividing tumor cells by targeting their cell division apparatus, but spare healthy dividing cells? Well, that's a very simple concept, but actually quite challenging to achieve in practice because the cell division machinery is fundamentally conserved and all cell types in our body, healthy and diseased, divide in the same way and use the same machinery. And so the way we've chose to attack this problem is to try to use a very old concept in genetics that is termed synthetic lethality. And broadly, what this postulates is that if you have these two genes, A and B, Neither of these genes alone is essential. If you remove A, cells are viable. If you remove B, cells are viable. However, if you remove them both together, this leads to a synthetic lethal relationship that kills the cell. Now imagine that gene A was frequently dysregulated during the process of tumor development. This now presents a great therapeutic vulnerability because inhibiting or turning off gene B would selectively kill those cancer cells that have already lost gene A. However, the healthy cells in the body where gene A is intact would be spared this fate. So you can think of this a little bit like a bicycle, having two brakes on the bicycle, there's some redundancy. But if one of these brakes is disarmed, for example, in a cancer cell, then targeting the remaining brake proves to be an attractive strategy to specifically kill those cancers. And this concept of synthetic lethality has been well validated therapeutically with the use of PARP inhibitors, something that Anthony Lung has worked on quite a lot. And these PARP inhibitors ultimately end up breaking the DNA. And as a result, cells have to repair these breaks, and they do it using DNA repair pathways that require BRCA1 and BRCA2. Now, you may have heard of BRCA1 and BRCA2 because they are tumor suppressor proteins. What that means is you get two copies of all your genes, one from mom and one from dad. But there are some patients that are born with a bad copy of BRCA1 or BRCA2. And these patients at a very high frequency, develop aggressive breast and ovarian cancers because they lose the remaining good copy of BRCA1 and BRCA2 at some point during their life, and that leads to the development of tumors that lack one of those proteins. But this also provides a synthetic vulnerability because if you remove BRCA1 and BRCA2, you now don't have a pathway to repair damage caused by PARP inhibition. And therefore, treating cancers that lack BRCA1 and BRCA2 with PARP inhibitors can kill the tumor cells, but the remaining normal cells still have a wild-type copy of BRCA1 and BRCA2 and are fairly resistant to this treatment. So based on this paradigm, we wanted to try to identify synthetic lethal interactions with the mitotic apparatus. And in particular, during mitosis, we know that there are at least three mechanisms that mediate microtubule nucleation, that build these microtubules of the mitotic spindle. And these pathways are at least somewhat redundant and are quite distinct from pathways that operate in interface cells. And we were particularly interested in this structure, the centrosome, which is a microtubule nucleating organelle, because we can remove centrosomes from cells by turning off the action of a kinase, known as pololite kinase 4 or POK4. Now, when you inhibit this enzyme, you stop making centrosomes, and therefore centrosomes are lost. And if we take POK4 inhibitors and we dose them across a variety of non-transformed cells and also several transformed cells, we find that they're very well tolerated. And this is consistent with the fact that there are redundant mechanisms for making microtubules during cell division, and POK4 is generally non-essential. So here you can see, if we look at growth from the blue staining, treatment with POK4 inhibitor has little impact in these cells. 
But what we uncovered was that some cells are highly dependent on centrosomes and highly dependent on PLK4 activity for their cell division and proliferation. And so here on the left, you can see an untreated cell. This is a breast adenocarcinoma cell line. It's dividing. And here on the right, we've treated it with a PLK4 inhibitor. So this cell has now lost its centrosomes. And what you recognize is this cell's trying very hard, but it just can't build that mitotic spindle. And therefore, it can't divide. And as a result, it dies. Now, if we look at this in this growth assay, you can see it here. We treat with the PLK4 inhibitor, and this leads to lethality in these cells. And this lethality does not require the presence of the tumor suppressor protein P53. So the question, therefore, is what's in the genetic background of these cells that's mediating this acute sensitivity to PLK4 inhibition? And so what we recognize was that these MCF7 cells harbor a specific amplicon that's present at a relatively high frequency in breast cancers. And an amplicon is a region of DNA that's repeated many times. And so the genes that are present in this amplicon are present in multiple copies. The proteins are overexpressed. And this likely is being selected for to drive aspects of tumor evolution. And one of the proteins that was in this cancer amplicon was this protein TRIM37 that acts as an E3 ubiquitin ligase, a protein that de promotes the degradation or destruction of other proteins. And we wondered whether the high expression of this gene might be responsible for mediating the sensitivity to PLP4 inhibitor. So to test this, we can deplete TRIM37 from these cells, first here using an shRNA. And what you can see is that we can largely rescue this sensitivity to PLP4 inhibition. And we can also do this with CRISPR-Cas9 to remove the extra copies of the TRIM37 gene, as you can see here. And now these cells are almost fully resistant to the PLK4 inhibitor. <coughs> so it seems that the overexpression of TRIM37 is rendering these cells addicted to centrosomes for cell division and therefore highly sensitive to PLK4 inhibitor treatment. And this is not just true of this single cell line. It's true of a class of cell lines that carry this same cancer amplicon and therefore overexpress TRIM37. Again, they're much more sensitive to PLK4 inhibitor. And again, the sensitivity can be rescued by depletion of TRIM37. Now, that was done in two-dimensional culture, but we wanted to look at this in more physiological assays. And so here we're looking at three-dimensional cultures, which is more akin to how these cells grow in a tumor environment. And here we're looking at the concentration of PLK4 inhibitor on the x-axis, survival on the y. And again, the cell lines that have higher levels of TRIM37 are more sensitive to PLK4 inhibitor. And we can also look at this in patient-derived organoids from primary human breast tumors. So here the tumors are taken from patients and immediately implanted into three-dimensional culture. And again, tumors that have higher levels of TRIM37 are more sensitive to PLK4 inhibition. So why is it that increased levels of TRIM37 are sensitizing cells to PLK4 inhibitor? Well, there are three pathways, as I mentioned, that contribute to mitotic spindle assembly. If we remove centrosomes with PLK4 inhibitor, we turn off this pathway. But what we found was that cells activate a latent pathway to drive microtubule nucleation and spindle assembly. And what we were able to show was that the high levels of TRIM37 shut down this latent pathway of spindle assembly. So under normal conditions, this is not problematic for these cells because they're using their centrosomes to make microtubules. But if you remove their centrosomes with PLK4 inhibitor and this pathway shut down through high expression of TRIM37, these cells cannot build a mitotic spindle and they cannot divide successfully. So elevated expression of TRIM37 is synthetic lethal with PLK4 inhibition. So just as I explained where PARP inhibitors are being used clinically to treat cancers that lack BRCA1 and BRCA2, this is about 5 to 10% of breast cancers, we would like to propose that tumors that overexpress TRIM37 would be, show increased sensitivity to PLK4 inhibitor. And we know that about 10% of human breast cancers, that's 30,000 patients in the United States a year alone, uh, have high levels of TRIM37 expression and about 50% of neuroblastomas, as well as a smattering of other cancers. And there are now uh, companies that are developing PLK4 inhibitors to try to test this paradigm. So what I told you here was that there is a genetic vulnerability in the cell division apparatus that's exposed here by an oncogenic profile that's unique to cancers. But of course, the question becomes, can this be more generalizable uh, than just this one specific example? 
And so I want to give you one more example now, uh, which is that of a kinesin called KIF18A. And KIF18A is a kinesin, so this is just a diagram of a kinesin. Here's a microtubule, and kinesins tow material along microtubules. They walk along them. And KIF18A is a kinesin that functions solely during mitosis, and it's fully non-essential. In normal cell types, you can delete it. They divide fine. You can even delete this in a mouse, and you get a fully normal mouse as far as we can tell. So in a collaboration with Amgen Pharmaceuticals, we received a novel and potent KIF-18A inhibitor. And so on the left here are some normal cells dividing culture. We've treated them with KIF-18 inhibitor. And consistent with the fact that this kinesin is non-essential, these cells proliferate in culture. By contrast, here's a cell line, an ovarian cancer cell line. We treat with the exact same inhibitor. And what you'll see is that these cells really struggle. They try very hard, but they just can't manage to complete mitosis, and they ultimately die. And so here's just a table showing you that normal cell lines, MCF10As, RP1s, are fully insensitive to KIF-18 inhibitor, and a certain subset of cancer cell lines are highly sensitive to KIF-18 inhibition. They're absolutely addicted to KIF-18 for their uh, proliferation and growth. The central question, of course, is why, and that is something that we don't yet fully understand, although we're working on it, so in this case, we don't understand what the genetic alterations are that are sensitizing these cancers to KIF-18 inhibitor, and we need to be able to identify that. We're working on this in collaboration with Amgen because that will define how you can use these inhibitors most optimally in the clinic. So what I've told you is that we think current antimitotic agents are failing in the clinic because they are not discriminating between killing healthy cells and killing tumor cells. And we believe that next generation antimitotic drugs should focus on exploiting vulnerabilities that are exposed by genetic alterations that are unique to the tumor cell. And so I gave you one example where overexpression of TRIM37 sensitizes tumor cells to PLP4 inhibition and renders these cells dependent on centrosomes for their growth. And in a second example, which we don't fully understand, a certain fraction of tumor cells are dependent on the kinesin KIF18A for their division. Now, in the last five minutes or so, I want to just tell you one other vignette, which is really a story about how following unexpected observations can take you in very uh, different directions. And this is really a story about how time impacts fate, as you can get from this Salvador Dali painting. So when cells go into mitosis, they compact down their chromosomes, and they shut down most essential cellular processes, transcription, translation. And so cells go through mitosis in a hurry. They get through this as quick as possible. Most cells will divide in about 20 to 30 minutes. And what we found was that if cells delay in mitosis, if they take longer than a certain threshold in cell division, then ultimately the progeny of those divisions either die or differentiate. And the interesting thing was that this would happen independent of whether these divisions actually occurred normally. So even if the division occurred normally, just the fact that it took a long time was sufficient to basically prevent the progeny from ever dividing again. And so we called this a mitotic surveillance pathway, and we carried out a genetic screen to try to identify the components that were responsible for arresting the growth of these cells that delay in mitosis. And that led us to this uh, pathway where two molecules are acting upstream to trigger a downstream molecule, and we're still working very hard to try to identify the basis of this clock. But of course, the question became, why would you do this? Why would cells want to measure mitotic length? What's the physiological relevance? So we just talked about how cells divide. They synthesize DNA during a specific period of time, S phase. Then they take a break, and then they go into mitosis and segregate that DNA, and then they have another break. And these breaks are really important because they give the cell an opportunity to make sure that that previous phase of the cell cycle was completed correctly before they go into the next phase. And these are what we call checkpoints, and that's their exact function, to make sure that things are correct before the cell moves on. And in mitosis, there's a well-established checkpoint called the spindle assembly checkpoint, sometimes known as the mitotic checkpoint. And really what this does is it delays cells in mitosis and provides a minimum duration of mitosis. It basically will not let a cell complete division until all of the chromosomes connect to microtubules of the mitotic spindle and do so correctly so that this can guarantee accurate chromosome segregation. 
So we think the mitotic surveillance pathway would act in concert with this because this would provide a maximum duration of mitosis. And cells that exceed this would not be allowed to continue and go on and proliferate. And this might make sense from the concept of a multicellular organism because many things that perturb cellular physiology and homeostasis lead to delays in mitosis. And so the time of mitosis is being used as a quality control sensor to remove from the proliferative population any cell that may be unfit or damaged and prevent that cell from further contributing to the organism. So this would postulate that this pathway is therefore being triggered sporadically in a small number of cases where a cell is undergoing some type of problem. But we wondered what would happen if this pathway was pathologically activated. It was turned on at a high level for too long. And that got us thinking about microcephaly. Now microcephaly is a disease where an individual is born with a brain that's more than two to three standard deviations smaller than the mean. And it's ultimately a disease of dysregulated cell proliferation because there are stem cells in the brain that divide to produce neurons. And if these stem cells don't divide frequently enough, you produce too few neurons and you end up with a smaller brain size. Now microcephaly can be caused by environmental insults like Zika viral infection, but it's also caused by genetic alterations. And over the last 15 years or so, human geneticists have mapped a large number of genes that are responsible for causing microcephaly in humans. And the big surprise is that about half of the genes that cause microcephaly in humans when mutated are components of the cell division apparatus. And the reason why this is strange is that these genes operate in all cells of our body, and yet when they're mutated, they seemingly give rise to selectively a small brain phenotype without other obvious manifestations. And so we began to wonder whether the alterations in these genes would be responsible for causing delays in mitosis. We could easily predict that any of these genes would cause cells to take longer to build a spindle and therefore take longer to divide. And as a result, they may trigger the mitotic surveillance pathway that would limit the proliferation of those stem cells in the brain and therefore limit the number of neurons that are produced. And we would have uh, anticipated that these neuroprogenitor cells maybe have a very low bar for the activation of this pathway. They're very sensitive. They only need very modest delays in mitosis in order to trigger this. So this was our hypothesis. A prolonged mitosis caused by mutations in these components activates the mitotic surveillance pathway to deplete the neuroprogenitor cells and cause microcephaly. So we can test this in mouse models. We can get animal models that carry mutations in the same genes that are mutated in human patients with microcephaly. And so here's one, a mutation in this centrosomal protein. And so these mice have a brain that's about 30 to 40% smaller at birth. And the microcephaly is so severe, these mice don't survive past two weeks of age. So then we can ask, what happens if we inactivate the mitotic surveillance pathway in this background? And what we can do is we can rescue brain size at birth, we can rescue brain size in adults, and we can even rescue this uh, lethality. And this is true not just knocking out one gene, but it's true knocking out any component of the mitotic surveillance pathway will rescue brain size in these mice. And we can show that this is true across multiple mouse models, all of which have alterations in cell division components, and all of which show delays in the division of neuroprogenitor cells. Now what's important to recognize here is that when we inactivate the mitotic surveillance pathway, we don't correct the upstream defect the delay in cell division is still present, but the cells no longer trigger this pathway. And as a result, they can go on and continue to proliferate, and they can establish the correct number of divisions and build a brain of normal size. So our model, therefore, is we think neuroprogenitor cells are dividing in a hurry. They divide usually within about 20 minutes to produce progeny that can go on and proliferate. But if they take too long to divide, they trigger this mitotic surveillance pathway and that triggers cell death and differentiation. And this happens, we think, pathologically in cases of microcephaly because the genetic mutations are causing cells to take too long to divide, and as a result, they chronically activate this pathway. So what I've told you is that delays in cell division activate the mitotic surveillance pathway, and we think the pathological and chronic activation of this pathway may be a cause of microcephaly, possibly other neurodevelopmental disorders, and this is a druggable pathway, so we're interested in whether therapeutic modulation would be useful. So I'll stop there. I just want to take a couple of moments to acknowledge a few people. 
First of all, all of my lab members, uh, current and past, these are undergraduates, uh, graduate students, postdocs, research technicians, lab managers, master's students, all of them have contributed and done all of the work that I just discussed and many things I didn't have time to. I feel really privileged to be able to work with all of these fantastic people. Collaborators who I didn't have time to go through, some of these contributed to these projects and there's many others beside. We're very fortunate and grateful to have had stable funding from the NIH and the American Cancer Society and we're very grateful for the PFA funding. I'm really privileged to be part of the Molecular Biology and Genetics Department. I think this is a incredible intellectual home and I have an incredible group of uh, really supportive and fantastic colleagues. Um, this is the previous members of the department and current members of the department. I particularly want to mention Randy Reed, who's been my mentor since I arrived here at Hopkins and really helped me every step of the way. I'm very grateful for all of his support. In the School of Medicine, Paul Rothman, Anthony Rosen, and Geraldine Seydoux, I think it's fantastic to be in a place that really prioritizes basic research and, and understands that basic biomedical discovery is really the root of all future treatments and advances in the clinic. I feel very privileged to be a part of that. At GHU, Ron Daniels, Sunil Kumar, Denis Wirtz for having the vision to start this award. Um, Ren and Julie and Michelle who've uh, provided support along the way. I'm very grateful for them. The PFA Selection Committee for selecting me for this as well as uh, acknowledgement for all the other finalists. And then finally, Lou Foster and, and David Smilo who generosity established these awards. It's really amazing to have the opportunity to have unrestricted funds that we can use to pursue some more unconventional ideas that we hope will uh, advance further our field. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. So I'd like to uh, congratulate you again, Andrew, for, for, Holland, for this amazing lecture. Truly really amazing. We're reaching you know, from basic science to translation and analysis. It's not always uh, what you to see. Uh, taking advantage of an amazing environment that allows you to tip into and move in new directions. And I hope this award will continue fueling that uh, curiosity, this, this creativity you have. You mentioned an amazing cohort of other uh, awardees of this uh, PFA, and uh, I hope we get a chance to, to all get together. Um, but without further ado, um, and you can post your questions on Twitter. Um, I'd like to um, uh, open the floor for questions. Please post your questions also on Twitter. I'll be monitoring those questions uh, as we speak. But uh, let's start with uh, uh, people in the audience. Do you have any questions for Professor Holland? Anthony. Uh, natural cells that have high level of Not that we know. You may want to repeat the question. Oh, sorry. So the question is, are there any natural cells that have high levels of TRIM37? Not that we've identified to date. We, don't, we, we haven't seen that. These cancer cells, for example, in this 17Q23 amplicon, can have 10 to 12 copies of this, and so they express extremely high levels. We haven't identified any natural cell types that express levels to, to that extent. Good question. So a follow-up, it then cannot be used as a biomarker, maybe to uh, guide treatment uh, potentially for cancer patients? Well, we think it possibly could because okay. it's only overexpressed, as far as we know today, in tumor cells. So, and those, th that would be a biomarker for cells that would be sensitive to PLK4 okay. inhibitor. Very nice. I've, uh, yeah, please, please. Other, so, uh, once you understand how the concept works, of course, it's not a cancer cell lines that have either overexpression or, or loss of function of other components of the pathway that would also render cells Yeah, that's a great question. So we, we know of other cell lines that are very POK4 inhibitor sensitive, and they are not sensitive for this reason. So there appear to be other mechanisms by how they can have high sensitivity to this inhibitor. Um, and we're actively pursuing that because we think those might be exciting new directions. And you could imagine that dysregulation of other components in the centrosome might be one uh, potential avenue 
by which they could become sensitive. Of, of uh, cell division and the involvement of those proteins you've identified. This is going back to your premise, right, to this building block that the cell constitute and very stereotypical this, this cell division seems to be. Uh, if you go back to you know, animals or even trees, I don't know, do you see, have you had a chance to, to see if there were a lot of generality in your observations? Yeah, so the process of cell division connecting to microtubules of a spindle apparatus through specialized structures on chromosomes, that's true throughout all life uh, in, in eukaryotes. The presence of the centrosomes is not true throughout all um, life. It's, it's missing in most plants, mm. and it's missing in some fungi, but it's true in, in the vast majority of other organisms. So there is some divergence in how cells are making microtubules for that cell division spindle. So you can use animal models to, to study any? Certainly vertebrate is. models, mice are very good replicas of what happens in humans and, mm -hmm. and all mammals, for example. Um, budding yeast, for example, are perhaps not because they don't have classical centrosomes. They have something called a spindle pole body, but it's an analogous structure okay. that does something very similar. It nucleates microtubules for cell division. I have another question, sorry. I don't want to monopolize the, the mic, but I hope you get motivated by this. Um, we touched on this you know, before the, your talk, but um, do, do you have the entrepreneurial bug or do you have uh, any temptation to, to start seeing, uh, I know you've passed on seemingly this observation to Amgen or other companies, but maybe to, to take advantage of this great in, you know, environment also to, to see maybe some of those uh, discoveries uh, through, uh, including the development of many molecules or antibodies that could uh, block you know, these processes. So that isn't anything that we've pursued so far, and we've definitely kept our focus very much on fund fundamental research with the idea of developing proofs of concepts that others will exploit. But I, I do think that that's an exciting thing for us to, yeah. to consider more in the future. I mean, you, you have an amazing environment right here. You know, of course, the yeah, cancer this is center. A great place and, to do it. and maybe beyond cancer, right? You, you, you already touched on this. This goes way beyond cancer as well. There's a question from the audience. Just one second. Do you, okay, sorry. Do you have any idea how late um, you could inhibit USP28, one of those molecules you've identified, uh, and rescue normal brain size in mice? Wow. Yeah, that's a very good question. I, good. I don't know that. So far, we've only done that genetically. Uh -huh. There are inhibitors that are being developed for that molecule by pharmaceutical companies. Uh -huh. uh, we have not found any that are, uh, that are suitably active uh, to try that, and I think we would need a small molecule to be able to test that idea. Um, I would imagine that there's a small window of time in which brain development mm -hmm. occurs in mice from embryonic day 10 to embryonic day 15. And so you would almost certainly have to inhibit within that window, so during development. Something you couldn't similar do it postnatally. In hu ah, okay. Yeah. Something similar than in humans as well. In humans as well. Once you're born with a small brain, I don't think there's very much that you can do to reestablish that um, postnatally. It's all, all that proliferation is done developmentally, and it needs to be corrected at that mm -hmm. stage. Incredibly exciting observation. Um, great talk, Andrew, uh, and congrats on the award. I wonder whether the rescue of small brain phenotype by knocking down strategy may cause any potential defect in those resulting cells. Yeah, that's Thanks. a great question. So what we find is, of course, these cells take too long to divide. If we carry out analysis to look at whether they make mistakes in division, the answer is very few, but more than in normal conditions. And in, in this model, at least, the structure and, and function of the brain seems relatively normal. Uh, but we certainly feel that there's likely to be additional consequences here from having uh, established a brain that was lacking centrosomes in this case. Um, so I definitely would not argue that you restore full wild-type functionality. But you may restore more functionality uh, than you would have otherwise had in the disease case. I couldn't help but notice that we had some of my favorite proteins, ORC and CDT1, a few others are in 
part of the pathway that you're talking about is controlling this clock. Any thoughts on, and there's some repair proteins, SMCs, any thoughts on whether they might also be involved in this clock? Is it, as you pointed out, they're basically giving rise to microcephaly, primordial morphism disorders, um, a certain capacity mutation. But there you have, at least in some cases, a defect in presumably initiation or elongation or maybe repair a stall porch or something like that. Yeah, so we think they're different. We think they essentially go through a DNA damage pathway. And we were able to show uh, that not in the case of ARC proteins, but some of these SMC proteins in mouse models of microcephaly, inactivation of this pathway does not rescue at all. But if you inactivate the DNA damage pathway, you can rescue. So it seems in this case that DNA breaks are causing the cell cycle arrest and ultimately reducing the proliferation. In the cases that I talked about, inactivation of the DNA damage pathway does nothing to rescue the proliferation. So we think there's at least two independent strands that ultimately feed into doing the same thing to reduce cell growth, but the upstream triggers are distinct and the pathways that feed downstream are distinct. Yeah, I was wondering about P18 and whether you think it's a coincidence that the only cancer cell you put there that was insensitive to P18 inhibitor is the MCF7s that are sensitive to the other synthetic methyl strategy. Yeah, so there's actually quite a wide range of cancer cells that are insensitive to K18 inhibitor. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a minority that are highly sensitive, and I would say most are like normal cells, they're not. Um, we do find that there may be some um, distinct vulnerabilities with uh, checkpoint inhibition. So cancer cells that are very sensitive to checkpoint inhibitors tend to be more resistant to KIF-18A and conversely. And, and we think that might be important for the mechanism. Um, but we haven't seen any, uh, any um, sort of co coincidence with PLK4 inhibition and sensitivity. Sorry, I'm going to have to ask another question. This is too fascinating work. Uh, I can see all kind of new avenues of uh, research opening up for these this discoveries. One that, though, uh, I'm asked all the time is the specificity of the cancer that, uh, uh, you know, there's a feeling among patients in particular that one cancer is just not another. And it, there's a lot of biological truth behind it. But uh, I'm tempted to ask a whole general motivations are for beyond ovarian cancer, maybe uh, breast cancer, do you think uh, the discoveries are in this potential target? Yeah, so I think that all of these are essentially um, individualized therapies. So they require a knowledge of the genetic alterations in the tumor cells. And if the tumor cells carry those specific alterations, then they will presumably be sensitive to these inhibitors since these are fundamental processes. We see an enrichment, for example, of the TRIM37 amplification in breast cancers, but we also see TRIM37 overexpression in a smattering of other cancers just less frequently. And so it clearly appears to be an oncoprotein that's overexpressed in a wide array of cancers, but at varying different frequencies. So I don't think what we've observed is necessarily specific to these cancers, but the genetic alterations are perhaps more enriched there. Amazing work. So let's... Uh uh, thank Andrew for an amazing lecture and uh, also a uh, warm congratulations again for this award. Thank you very much.